The time being 8.30, the meeting of the redistricting committee for Wednesday, September 15th will come to order. This remote hearing is taking place in accordance with House Rule 10.01 and is being live streamed by the House Public Information Office. Mr. Bursari, please call the roll. Uh, Chair Murphy? Present. Vice Chair Cleborn? Present. Uh, Representative Torkelson? Present. Representative Bonner? Representative Bonner? Present. Uh, Representative Garofalo? Representative Garofalo? Representative Greenman? Present. Representative Igo. Representative, Present. oh, all right. Uh, Representative Lee oh, is excused. Uh, Representative Long. Present. Representative Munson. Present. Representative Nash. Representative Nash. Representative New Brindley. New Brindley present. Representative O'Driscoll. Representative O'Driscoll. Representative Olson. Present. Representative Stansted. Representative Sanstead. Representative Schultz. Representative Schultz. Representative Stevenson. Present. Repres Ooh, welcome. Uh, Representative Vang. Present. Uh, Representative West. Present. Uh, Representative, Chair, Representative O'Driscoll present. Oh, thank you. Um, Representative Nash. Uh, Representative Nash. Representative Sandstead. Representative Sandstead is excused. Oh, thank you. Uh, Madam oh, and Representative Schultz. Representative Schultz. Uh, Madam Chair, a quorum is present. Madam Chair, Representative O'Driscoll, I just want to make sure I was checked in. I apologize yes. for. Oh, I'm yes, you're checked in and you're welcome. And I think Schultz is uh, excused also. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so a quorum is present, Mr. Basari. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, a quorum is present. All right. So we will begin the meeting. This is our fifth led listening session. We posted this meeting a month ago to give public notice uh, a little longer than usual. This is a critical component of our work and we value the perspectives each person offers and each congressional district that we've covered so far has been totally different from the others. Um, it's a critical component of our work as we go forward to um, decide on the principles and on uh, where the lines for redistricting should be drawn across the state. We welcome input from all Minnesotans. Uh, we are holding the hearings via Zoom at a variety of times to reach a wide range of people. We acknowledge that no schedule fits every person. So if people are not available to participate via Zoom today uh, or during the, this time period, the option to submit written testimony is provided and the committee will accept um, written testimony for um, these meetings uh, throughout the month of September. We ask that testimony be limited to five minutes or less to provide opportunity for everyone who wants to testify. For those who had more to say than time allowed, they too can their te added te testimony in writing. 
to supplement their oral testimony. However, given the number of people who did sign up, we do have a little bit of extra time. And so if you run over, nobody's going to cut you off. We're very pleasant that way. Written testimony containing recommendations will be posted on the redistricting committee website. As I said, submissions will be accepted through the end of September. Of September. The purpose of these public input sessions is for members to listen and to what the public has to say. Unless it's for purposes of clarification, members will try to hold comments so that we can hear from everyone that wants to testify. We have um, our time blocked off this morning, but we are going to have summary uh, as we have in every uh, congressional district hearing that we've placed so far from our nonpartisan house research uh, person, Matt Gehring, and Dr. Susan Brower, who is a um, state demographer and works for the state of Minnesota in the Department of Administration. And she gives a summary of what's happened in the congressional district um, since 2010. And uh, what happened that as a result of the census that was taken in 2020. So Ms. Brower, will you uh, please get on Zoom and um, tell us uh, your summary of the demographic, demographic changes in District 1 of the state of Minnesota. Thank you for coming and we welcome your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Susan Brower. I work in the Department of Administration, and I'm Minnesota's state demographer. I'm going to share with you this morning uh, what we saw out of the 2020 census with respect to Congressional District 1. And what we learned from the 2020 census was that the district, the first district, the first congressional district added 27,735 people to that district over the course of the decade. Uh, the first district's total population now stands at 690,726, which is currently 22,586 under the ideal population size of 713,312. So if the committee decides to uh, keep similar boundaries for these districts uh, after this next cycle of redistricting, uh, this district, district number one, will need to grow in population size um, by 22,586 to meet that ideal population size. So growing in geographic and in population uh, size over, over this next cycle. The first district, of course, stretches across the entire southern edge of the state from South Dakota to Wisconsin. Its largest city is Rochester, uh, and Rochester registered among the top cities for growth in the state this decade, adding 14,626 residents. So Rochester's population now stands at about 121,000. So it makes up a fair, uh, a sizable share of this district overall. Uh, but uh, the district also includes uh, another metro, of course, Mankato, which also grew. North Mankato and Mankato jointly added about 6,000 people this decade. And we'll zoom in just a bit more to see uh, the district here. Uh, in terms of some of the other large uh, cities, what happened with their growth, uh, Fairmont and Winona lost population during the decade, uh, but other cities, Albert Lee, Austin, Owatonna, Worthington, all grew anywhere between about 500 and 1,200 residents. 
Uh, I mentioned that North Mankato and Mankato grew this decade. Rochester really led the growth uh, in this district. The population is really concentrated in Olmstead County. You can see there are many counties that make up this district. Um, the city of Rochester and Olmstead County really hold uh, a, a large concentration of, of this district in terms of population. Um, but we can see that there's also other districts that have uh, larger cities that have uh, the metropolitan area, Mankato, as I said, and many of these counties are largely rural agricultural communities whose uh, population lives in more spot sparsely populated townships. I shared earlier that the first district grew by about 28,000 people. You can see that here in the total. Uh, what we learned from the 2020 census is that in the first congressional district, the white population declined by about 20,000. Um, this is on par with what we've seen in many other districts and for the state overall, as the population ages and the white non-Hispanic population is largely concentrated in those older age groups, uh, we start to see a decline in those populations. As we saw in many other districts uh, is true of District 1 as well, that we saw growth in BIPOC communities or Black, Indigenous, people of color. Uh, communities across the state. That was true for uh, Congressional District 1 as well, as you can see from this data table. BIPOC communities now make up 18% of this district. Uh, the Hispanic or Latino population is the second largest after white non-Hispanic. Um, and in this first district, it grew by about 15,000 residents over the course of the decade. Black populations, Asian populations, and those identifying with multiple race groups also grew, uh, showing strong growth over the course of the decade. Um, and as I have noted in earlier sessions, race is just one way that um, communities of interest are defined, uh, but it's one of the ways that the census quantifies uh, one way of defining um, interests. And so that's kind of a, a very quick overview of how the racial composition of, of the district changed. Now, I just want to briefly note that there were changes in data collection um, that shift kind of the racial composition of what we see coming out of the 2020 census. For the first time, the Census Bureau allowed people to write in, um, in more places on the form uh, potentially identifying with more racial groups. And that seems to have increased the um, number of people who reported that they were more than one race. Although we know that number has truly been growing, um, it's, it appears to be both part of a data collection issue and uh, a true issue on the ground where we have more people um, truly identifying with, with um, more than a single race. This is a good thing because it reflects uh, better how people understand themselves. It lines up better with the forms, um, but we just need to pay attention to the extent that we're able with this multiple race category um, because it's no longer kind of a small, um, a small group. It's really a large and growing substantial size of the population. We are still assessing the quality of the 2020 census. Uh, the census took place during a worldwide pandemic which impacted operations. Uh, and there's a re very real possibility that that had impact on the quality of the data that are used for redistricting. However, the data that we have are the data that we have for redistricting. Um, and so even though their merit, you know, all censuses have errors built in, uh, what we will do because of the pandemic is pay extra close attention to things that may uh, not look quite right. Um, if you see something, uh, please do report it to us and we'll be happy to investigate and see if we can find out if this really true, uh, if anything that looks unusual appears to be a measurement error or if it really is a true change. 
Um, the final change uh, to the 2020 census that I want to note is that there was a new method called differential privacy that was introduced with these data um, meant to protect the privacy and confidentiality of individuals responding to the census, which is a good thing. However, we're not quite sure of what the impact is on the data. So again, if you see something that looks irregular, please don't hesitate to come to us. Um, and we're happy to uh, try to disentangle any kind of measurement or differential privacy issues from any true changes. Um, that concludes my prepared remarks, Madam Chair. I'm happy to take questions and I'm looking forward to hearing testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Brower. Um, this is a little bit different because district, we sometimes forget that district one goes all the way across the state. And um, to the Iowa border also. And um, thank you for your input and your summary. Um, Matt Gehring, welcome. Thank and you, Madam please Chair. give us your timeline that we have to follow or that we get to follow. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, just for the record, Matt Gehring from the House Research Department. Um, this will be a very short presentation, just a refresher on the timeline uh, and to point out the document that's available in the uh, committee materials for those in the audience who may uh, not be familiar with it. Um, uh, the document has two pages. Uh, the first page is the calendar of key dates in the redistricting process. The key date for all of you is February 15th of 2022. Um, that's the date that state law expects that you will have enacted um, new congressional and legislative district boundaries. Uh, and as, I, as you can see, there are dates that come after that that are more important at the local government level. So March 29th, 2022 and April 26th of 2022 are both deadlines that exist. Uh, for the establishing of new um, or reestablishing of uh, municipal precincts, as well as um, the deadline for adopting new local government uh, election districts, which could include wards or other types of boundaries that exist at the political subdivision level. Um, the first uh, election cycle at which all these new districts will need to be um, used is the 2022 cycle. So that um, leads to the final deadline uh, period here of uh, August 9th, which is the date of the state primary uh, next year. Uh, the second page of the handout um, just highlights the key responsibilities across um, the levels of government that we have in Minnesota. Uh, the legislative responsibilities for redistricting include congressional and legislative district uh, boundaries, and that, in that includes the process you're engaged in right now, which is taking public testimony, uh, as well as adopting principles, and the principles are the uh, sort of rules or guidelines that you'll use to decide uh, how you exactly put the boundaries on the map. Um, some of the principles will come from the federal constitution. You're required to conform to um, federal requirements of equal population, uh, as well as federal law regarding um, uh, minority communities and language minority communities. Uh, and then you may also choose to adopt other principles that will guide your work uh, at your discretion uh, within the committee here. Uh, there's also uh, some county, city, town, and school district responsibilities for the local government redistricting that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and I've got the bullet points here on page two, uh, along with some citations to the relevant places in state law where you can find more information about that process, including uh, the standards that are required to be used to, to draw new uh, local district boundaries, uh, as well as um, timelines and what happens if that work doesn't get completed in a, time, in a timely way. And Madam Chair, I think I'll uh, leave it at that. This document is available um, on the committee website uh, for those who are interested. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Brower. Thank you very much, Mr. Gehring. I don't see any questions, and so we'll go into the testifying period of time. Um, some people, we have 10 people signed up to, or 11 people signed up to testify, plus some written testimony that was provided uh, to members and posted. As we listen, it might be helpful to keep in mind the definition of communities of interest presented to us by Wendy Underhill from the National Conference of State Legislatures. Communities of interest, geographical areas such as neighborhoods of a city, 
or regions of a state where the residents have common demographic or and political interests that do not necessarily coincide with the boundaries of a political subdivision, such as a city or county. First up to testify today is Sam Hansen, Brown County Administrator. Mr. Hansen. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'll try to pack 50 pounds of potatoes in a five pound bag and be brief here for you this morning. Um, I just wanna emphasize the importance of keeping counties as whole as possible for the House and Senate seats. Um, and that's helpful in minimizing confusion with the public and also in election administration. Minnesota has a great track record of clean elections and prompt results. In last year's election, um, Brown County specifically, we were stretched really thin staff-wise due to a COVID outbreak in our auditor treasurer office. And if it weren't for pretty much getting somebody off the street to work part-time to assist us, with money paid for in the CARES Act money. It would have been put us in a really difficult position due to excess staff time required with the mail-in balloting that we saw a huge increase in. Um, splitting the House and Senate would add confusion to our residents if we did that inside of our county. Um, heck, I still get educated voters who changed commissioner districts 10 years ago, unsure who their commissioner is due to a change back in 2010. So we have legislators contact information published in our paper on a weekly basis. Splitting that up would be confusing. Confusing. I also believe by not keeping counties as whole as possible, that would lead to slower election results and a higher cost administering our elections. We strive not to make the national news by getting our results submitted in an accurate and timely manner. I ask you today to consider our request to keep us as whole as possible and help us maintain that both now and in the future. Heck, after all, keeping track of Representative Torkelson is enough work as it is. Thank you very much for your time and I wish you a great hearing. Thanks. So could you express a little, in a little more detail, what you mean by keeping the county whole when you have over 14 counties in the congressional district? Are you saying that they should all be in your congressional district? Or are you saying that in the, when we're doing the House districts and the Senate districts, you want the three to be together? That is correct. Yes, we would like the three to be together. Okay, but you have no no serious interest in if there's has to be seventeen counties together or fourteen counties together. That's fine with the stretching across the state. That is really something that. I'm talking Brown County specifically. Okay. Keep, keeping us all in one. I mean, I like to see is, but that, I'll leave that other decision to the people who are getting more into the dirty details on that. But okay. as far as counties in general, it, it's nice to keep that all in the House, Senate, congressional seat all in one. Thank, thank you for that clarification. That's That's a big one. Appreciate that we appreciate your interest, and uh, uh, we have trouble with Representative Torkelson sometimes too. But it's okay; he's a good leader, and uh, we appreciate his additions to our committee. So thank you, Mr. Hansen, or, or Administrator Hansen, Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Since Good my morning. name was mentioned, Good morning. Uh, <laughs> if I ever give you any trouble, Madam Chair, please call me out and uh, we'll, we'll repair the situation immediately. Thank you. <laughs> and what about Mr. Hansen? 
Are you uh, do you, uh, very... you want to share your schedule with him on a more local level or? I, Madam Chair, I do my best to stay in close contact with all my local officials, <laughs> including Mr. Hanson. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll vouch for that. He does a very good job communicating with us. Very good. Thank you. The second person on the agenda today is Jeanette Dean. Yes, I'm here. And I'm ready to begin if and I can be heard. Am we're I being... glad we're glad to have you and we can hear you and we can see you. Wonderful. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, happy to be here. My testimony is about five minutes, so I hope I won't be going over. You'll be fine. Okay, wonderful. Then let me begin. So good morning, Madam Chair Murphy and committee members. I am Jeanette Dean from Caledonia, Minnesota in Houston County, and I'm a La Crescent High School graduate. I also fondly remember the privilege of being a page one year at the Minnesota legislature while in high school. I now work on environmental policy and human rights, as well as social movements and social change using my dual degree in political science and sociology as an alumna of the University of Southern California and the University of Nevada, Reno. Like many people, I believe in the benefits of a well-balanced mixed economy that combines both public and private enterprise with two other crucial elements. One, strong regulatory oversight to prevent what is called regulatory capture of our government's legislative, executive, and judicial branches at both the federal and state levels, and two, better rules and enforcement of ethics in government against those who choose to abuse their office and our democracy for private benefit over public benefit. Today, September 15th, is in fact our United Nations International Day of Democracy, which began to be observed in 2007. And as your work today and forward includes redistricting, which significantly impacts our elections, and therefore our entire democracy and people's lives and well-being, I would like you to know that the UN website at un.org explains that today's International Day of Democracy, and I quote, provides an opportunity to review the state of democracy in the world. Democracy is as much a process as a goal. And only with the full participation of and support by the international community, national and state governing bodies, civil society, and individuals can the ideal of democracy be made into a reality to be enjoyed by everyone, everywhere. It furthermore states that the values of freedom, respect for human rights, and the principle of holding periodic and genuine elections by universal suffrage are essential elements of democracy. In turn, democracy provides the natural environment for the protection and effective realization of human rights. These values are embodied in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and further developed in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which I add the U.S. is a party to, of course, and it enshrines the host of political rights and civil liberties underpinning meaningful democracies. And I will again add that includes free and fair elections. So today, I ask that you do your best now and forward to make sure we have fair and inclusive electoral maps all across our state to correct and or prevent the unfair political advantage of gerrymandering in Minnesota's congressional districts, including in my own congressional district one and also nearby district two, which you are 
discussing today. While I know that we in CD1 have lost population with respect to the ideal size of congressional district maps, I hope that in the future our population will continue to grow further, particularly with the regenerative and sustainable neighborhood food hubs that would create employment for many and which are part of the Minnesota legislature's important headwaters community food and water bill. And finally, in going back to achieving fair redistricting, I have learned and wish to share that one, we must have districts that are equal in population by 1% or less to provide every Minnesotan fair power in voting. Two, we must create maps that elect public officials that reflect the diversity of Minnesota and prevent districts from being drawn to divide or concentrate minority groups, which includes Black people, Indigenous people, people of color, racial groups, ethnic groups, or members of a language minority group. Three, we must avoid districts from being drawn using the home addresses of incumbents or candidates for public office or that give an advantage or disadvantage to any political party or candidate. And four, we must prevent gerrymandering, gerrymandered districts that are not convenient for the voters who live there. A convenient district means a person can travel across the whole district without ever leaving it. Finally, I would like to remind everyone that while redistricting can protect our democratic process when it is fair, our CD1 and CD2 elections in 2020 were severely undermined by third party candidates as well whose motives and decisions to run were proven to have been made in collusion in CD1 or suspected to have been made in collusion in CD2 in one with members of the Republican Party for their unfair political advantage. So again, it was proven in CD2, suspected in CD1. And that, of course, harms all residents in a dis district through corruption. So redistricting cannot solve that crucial problem, which hurts all of the district's residents, voters, volunteers, and communities through corruption. And so we in Minnesota and across the country need to find better ways to prevent ungenuine third-party candidates in Minnesota and other states, too, who are encouraged to run by another party for their own advantage in election outcomes. I thank you again, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you very much, Ms. Dean. We appreciate your summary and your advice. Thank you. Ms. Shaniqua Johnson. Uh, thank you so much and good morning, Chair Murphy and the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to um, call in today from Worthington, Minnesota and Nobles County. I'm not currently representing an organization, but just wanted to take a little minute to uh, of the, the committee's time to just simply highlight the importance and significance of Nobles County and Worthington, the city of Worthington, Minnesota. So, um, you know, the area of Nobles County, for those that are looking in, you know, it does stretch, Congressional District 1 does stretch across uh, 14 counties. Nobles County is the second, you know, county from the western part of the state, about 45 minutes from the South Dakota border is where it starts, and about, uh, and it does carry us all the way into Iowa. And so, um, you know, I wanted to be brief today just with my testimony, and I wanted to highlight two things of significance and importance. One, I'd really like to advocate for Nobles County and the city of Burlington to stay in Congressional District 1. Um, and I'd also like to talk through the importance of uh, just some of the changing demographics that are currently happening in the city of Burlington and Nobles County in particular. So uh, in our space of the, of the area of state, yes, Congressional District 1 does stretch across um, you know, the bottom half of this, the bottom end of the state. 
um, moving that into a different congressional district doesn't necessarily change that factor. It just sifts with which borders we're talking about, whether it's the Canadian and Iowa borders um, of CD7 or the um, South Dakota to um, Wisconsin borders that are currently placed in CD1. Um, I grew up in Worthington, Minnesota. I was born and raised in Worthington, Minnesota. I identify as African-American. Um, my family uh, migrated from the Southern states and just kind of coming through this space. The one thing I didn't, um, the narrative that I don't necessarily uh, identify with or share is the largest growing uh, population in the city of Worthington, which is our immigrant population and our uh, Latino population. In the city of Worthington, that's about 42% of the people we are talking about. And so just in that capacity and just looking into how um, much Nobles County and the city of Wellington have diversified in all aspects, whether that be the age being around, you know, somewhere in, um, in the, like the 36 years old or 30, you know, 34 years old, I myself am 26. And so I'm like below the average age, but significantly how that has changed over the last 10 years and the last decade. Um, it's important to note that even in this county that's super diverse, that has about 42% of people identifying as Latino, which is surpassing the amount of ethnicity of our, our white counterparts as well. Um, we do not have a single person of color currently in that county uh, representing them on any level of government, um, any level of administration, whether that be the city, the county, or the school uh, districts that are there. Uh, in a lot of places that you go in, people don't necessarily look like me, uh, and it's harder to maneuver that space. However, the county demographics and the county population and the people currently living there are doing a lot to advocate for their voices and beginning to raise uh, just some really strong concerns. And it's been really fun to see the transition over the last few years as both a community leader and someone who's heavily involved, not only in the uh, organize, organizing, but the bridging of the gap between the local governments and the city uh, of Warrington and the population as a whole. And just getting folks to talk through important things like this, of coming in to testify and knowing that it's a part of the conversation. Um, so often it can look a certain way because people can look into the outcomes of Nobles County. They can look through the uh, past elections, maybe even looking through what the congressional district looked like uh, before 2013, before the census reports came out in 2010. And it's just important to keep in mind that as folks are continuing to utilize their voice and knowing through their privilege of voting, more people becoming citizens and being able to utilize that right uh, that they didn't have necessarily all the time based off of where their stories come from, where their uh, families come from, and they're learning how to utilize that. And I think, you know, just looking through the congressional district uh, that as it currently stands, there's a lot more people that can relate to the personal experience of someone um, in CD1, either they're from uh, Mauer County or from Nobles County in places where, have, where they have a lot of people of color, where they have a large people of color index. It's just significantly important not to overlook that part of the state. And I know that you all will consider that and see how important it might be to uh, you know, maintain smaller counties, to keep the sizes ideal. My hope would be that you also consider uh, strongly keeping Nobles County into Congressional District 1. Um, we have a space where right now that's currently in the Senate District of 22 and the House District of 22B and in CD1. Um, Senate District 22 does split between CD7 and CD1. It's about a 50 mile radius and just kind of going through uh, and talking to folks, the, the, the um, experiences are quite different depending on where you are in that area of the Senate district. Um, that might also be a place to just kind of look in to see how those lines are drawn to which communities they include. Um, and really just taking the moment to take a little extra look basically at that part of the state. Um, and just to, you know, and for what it's worth, talk through the importance of how representation matters and protecting uh, black indigenous people of color representation is significant. I think that also includes Nobles County in that mix. I think looking at some of the spaces where we have a large population of people of color, even in rural Minnesota, as far as the greater Minnesota population of Southwest Minnesota, Nobles County and the city of Warrington by far are one of the communities that has a large, the large, one of the largest amounts of diversity in that area of the state for sure. Um, more than 50 languages are spoken in that community and just being able to be here um, and bear witness to it all. There's a lot of potential here. 
And I think it's just important to highlight. And that's really what I wanted to talk through uh, and just give some uh, clarity to that. You know, obviously there's demographic changes. I mean, my population is the African-American population and CD1 is up by 43%. And in just some cases where we're seeing more folks that look like me coming to these areas, uh, shifting leadership may be confusing to them and off-putting. And in some capacities, I hope that the lines of, uh, the geographic lines of being able to go from border to border are considered uh, kind of as a plus, but also uh, carefully. <laughs> and just knowing that like, we really would like our leadership to be accessible. We really would like to continue to you know, work in the communities in which we are familiar. And just to kind of talk through those spaces, uh, whether that be now or then, we invite you all to just continuing to highlight what we're doing here and coming into the area. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnson. Um, just for a little clarification on some of the things that you said, when you leave Nobles County, where do you go? Or do you leave Nobles County? <laughs> but sometimes um, you've got to get out of Nobles County, right? Absolutely. And I do frequently. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, I've had the wonderful opportunity to be able to travel many places throughout the state, uh, especially in the last even during the pandemic, like just I've made it my business to really try to get out to as many counties as possible throughout the state of Minnesota. And so that has been my um, jazz. But most of the time, you know, I I enjoy Hennepin and Ramsey County quite often. <laughs> OK, so you go a little north and a little east. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Any other questions? Thank you so much for your testimony. and. Uh, your advice and we appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Mark Lebo or Mark Libo. Mark Lebo. Yes, thank you. Thank you. It's Lebo. Um, Chair Murphy, Vice Chair Cleveborn. Lee Torkelson and members of the redistricting committee. Good morning and thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today. My name is Mark Lebo um, and I live in Rochester, the largest city in the first congressional district as Dr. Brower pointed out. I've lived here for almost 29 years. I wanna testify about drawing legislative districts in Olmstead County. 30 years ago, the redistricting of the 1990s created a Senate district that was almost exclusively in Rochester when the population of Rochester was a few thousand more than was needed for a Senate district. The Senator and both representatives from that district were quite attentive to the needs of the city and its people over the next decade. However, in 2001, the then mayor of Rochester asked that Rochester, which had grown by 15,000 people in the decade, and so is now the size of 1.2 Senate districts, be split in half in hopes of having two senators responsive to the needs of the city. It wasn't inherently a bad idea, but in hindsight, it backfired. More importantly, it split communities of interest. Most of the minority populations in Southeast Minnesota live in Rochester. And unlike some other cities, they're not concentrated in a neighborhood or too close by neighborhoods. Splitting Rochester in half diluted their ability to elect representatives of their choice or to advocate effectively for their interests, especially in the state Senate. Um, in Duluth, the only other regional city, uh, center city whose population is more than that needed for a Senate district is concentrated into one Senate district with only a small amount of the city overflowing into an adjacent district. Fortunately, remedying this problem has become easier. Rochester has continued to grow briskly with 35,600 more people than 20 years ago. It's just 6,300 people short of having enough people for three house districts. So any redistricting that doesn't just split the city in half again will help give Rochester a senator whose focus is on the city. However, if we want to best accommodate communities of color, which are largely in the northwest and southeast parts of that city, combining the successors to House Districts 26A and 25B into a Senate district will do, will do that. And um, it's important to realize that the current Senate Districts 25 and 26, between them, cover Rochester, uh, cover Olmstead County, sorry, while um, Senate District 25 also has 14,875 people in Dodge County. 
both those Senate districts have more people than the ideal population for a district given the growth in Olmstead County. All other districts in Southeast Minnesota have too few, so it'd be reasonable to give up territory at the east and west ends of those two. While it might seem uh, reasonable to give up almost everything in Dodge County, um, Casson is increasingly becoming a, a bedroom suburb of Rochester. So it makes sense to keep Casson nearby Manorville and Manorville Township, which surrounds both of them, in a district that includes Olmsted County. That district could become the district of most of the smaller cities and rural townships in Olmsted County, which is in itself trying to unite communities of interest. Um, this would leave two house districts completely in Rochester, and a fourth that would be made up of southern Rochester, Stewartville, and adjacent townships. These would be contiguous and relatively compact. Thank you again for letting me testify today, and I'm happy to take any questions. Mr. Lebo, for clarification purposes, how did you, um, is this just an interest of yours or is this historical record that you presented to us uh, based on uh, a community employment or um, it's more how, 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 how did you how did you say I'm going to talk to this panel and I'm going to tell them how it should be it's more What's an your interest, background it's more on an interest that? of mine it actually has little to do with what I do for work which I'm a, I'm a semi-retired internist in Rochester this is just an okay. interest of mine and um, something I've done digging into it was very comprehensive and I really appreciate it and you've put a lot of thought to what could go together and what could be um, excused. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Brad Edwin, Freeborn County Commissioner. Good morning, my name is Brad Edwin. I live at 72458 239th Street, Albert Lee, Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for your time today. I will keep this very brief. Let me start out by stating our county, Freeborn County, has become more diversified over the years and represents accurately cross-section of rural Minnesota. I also don't feel redistricting should be used in such a way that allows one political party advantage over another. My testimony today is speaking specifically on house redistricting. I ask today that you keep the city of Albert Lee and Freeborn County whole. By allowing Freeborn County to be whole, it conforms to the political boundaries of the county and the cities within. This in turn allows our community one voice, focusing on our needs and the ability to together create goals to better our community. It works best for us to be able to reach out to one representative and express our thoughts and ideas. It also enables the person elected by that same community to better understand the issues we face and act on them. It allows them to address and work towards those same common needs and goals. This allows better representation and accountability. By keeping Albert Lee and Freeborn County whole, contiguity is achieved. I respectfully ask that you take my comments into consideration. And again, thank you for your time and allowing me to speak. Commissioner, how much of Freeborn County is not Albert Lee? Albert Lee is within all of Freeborn County's boundaries. Yes, and how much more is there in Freeborn County than Albert Lee? As far as population, Madam Chair? Yeah, or as uh, points of interest, either population or points of interest. The population of Freeborn County is a little over 30,000 people. Albert Lee is about 18,000. Okay. 
So I are there any other cities in Freeborn County? Numerous small cities, towns, um, uh, to name a few, we have Clarks Grove, Alden, Manchester, Conger, Twin Lakes, Emmons, Hollandale, Myrtle, Glenville, and a few others. Okay. I appreciate that added information. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Sylvia Rolfs. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair Murphy and the committee for allowing me to present this testimony this morning. Um, having heard Mark's, Mark Lebo's testimony, this is going to build slightly on that, but I assure you that Mark and I did not even know each other was um, doing this until we saw the list. And, and so we have not talked, but it's very interesting having now heard his testimony. Uh, my name is Sylvia Rolfs. I'm resident of Dodge County in CD1. Dodge County is one of the smallest, if not the smallest county in Minnesota. The 2020 census shows Dodge County with just under 21,000 residents. We sit between Olmstead County, so Rochester to the east, and Steele County, which contains Owatonna to the west. In addition, Austin and Albert Lee are to our southwest. For reference, Olmstead County has nearly 163,000 residents, Steele County about 37,500. As we are currently districted, Dodge County has been divided up so parts of the county are in four Senate districts and five House districts. To be more specific, House District 21B has one township within Dodge County, 25A has four townships, 24B has four townships, 27A has two townships, and 27B has one township. And if that's confusing, you're right. <laughs> this means that there are nine people who are supposed to represent the people of Dodge County. But the reality is that none of these people really concern themselves with Dodge County because their piece of Dodge County that is in their district is very small compared to the rest of their district. The best situation we have is Senate District 25. And there are four Dodge County townships which has the largest part of the Dodge population, about 14,000 people total, that pales in comparison to the rest of the district, which is in Olmstead County. So roughly half of Rochester and Western Olmstead County is also in SD25, rough guess about 80,000 people. So as an elected official, where would you spend your time and political capital? It's not in Dodge County. Some of the other house districts are even worse. 27B has about 600 people in Vernon Township in Dodge County. The rest of the district is in Mauer County and includes the city of Austin. HD 27A has two Dodge County townships with approximately 2,000 people total. The rest of that is in Mauer and Freeborn counties and includes the city of Albert Lee. Not one of these senators or representatives live in Dodge County. In fact, it's nearly impossible for someone from Dodge County to get elected because they do not live where the largest part of the population in the district lives. If you look at the map of the legislative districts on the Secretary of State's website, it's easy to see how badly some of these district lines were drawn. It was done as a matter of numbers only not an attempt to create districts that made any sense. So that 27A, those 27A townships are way on the, the eastern edge of 27A, and then it sort of trickles over into um, Mauer and Freeborn counties. And it's, it is, um, a, while it meets the definition, you can drive across it barely. While I recognize that Dodge County is far too small to be even a house district with 21,000 people. We need to be a more significant part of a district or two. So we're a large enough part of that district for the senators and representatives to have to pay attention to Dodge County. Please do not rip, rip Dodge County apart again. 
the residents of Dodge County deserve representation in our state government. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you very much, Judge. Thank you very much, Judge. I guess I'm gonna stop talking. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Ross. And uh, you have given us a different perspective of counties and, and divisions of the House of Representatives uh, districts. I appreciate that a lot. Um, thank you, and we'll go on to um, Ethan Sykes. Hello, um, thank you, Chair Murphy and members of the committee. Um, again, good morning, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to testify today at the first congressional district redistricting committee listening session. Um, and my name is Ethan Sykes and I grew up in Butterfield, Minnesota, which for people who don't know that it's a small city about 45 minutes Southwest of Mankato. Um, and I currently live in Eagle Lake. My parents still live in Butterfield and I'm going to college at Minnesota State University, Mankato. Um, and I'm studying political science because for one politics is extremely important to me and uh, one way to show that politics is important to me is that I've registered almost 500 people to vote before the 2020 election. And then I plan to register another thousand people to vote this upcoming year for the 2022 midterm election. I think it's important that people get out and vote. I think it's important that their votes count as well in terms of how the lines are drawn. Um, and I'm here today that to ensure that the lines are drawn in a matter that doesn't disenfranchise voters and continues to keep the first congressional district a competitive race. The first congressional district was a competitive race in 2018 and once again in 2020. And I think it's important when we, that we keep this in mind when redrawing the district lines. Um, we need to be sure that there's no major advantage for one party over the other. Another point I wanna bring up is communities of interest. Um, I've, I've heard other people talk about this today and I also think that this is something really important that we need to keep in mind when redrawing these lines. In the past, the communities have been split up um, to give an unfair advantage to one party over the other. And I think that's something that's important to keep these communities of interest together. And several mapping ideas would attempt to split them apart. And I would ask that we try and stay away from doing this as much as possible. Um, another thing I'd like to bring up is to have redistricting the first con congressional district be as convenient as possible. And what I mean by this is on my drive from Butterfield to Mankato, a 45 minute drive, I would rather not drive through four different congressional districts. Um, I, I, would, I would like things to be structured in a way where it would probably only take be one congressional district I drive through the entire time as it is now. Um, and my final point that I wanna talk about today is splitting up like specific cities, I guess. So for example, um, during the last redistricting session, New Prague was split up um, in, the, in the middle of the city on the main road being the divide. And there was an article in the Star Tribune and it explained how community members were sort of confused and it was really odd that their permanent address on one side of New Prague had a different, represent, different representative for the congressional district than the other side or their business on the other side of Main Street. Um, and that was split between district one and two. And as a short summary of what I'm asking this listening session is that you guarantee that people, um, people's votes and ideas will count when in, in terms of how the lines are drawn um, and make sure that the lines are drawn in a fair manner while minimizing splitting up communities. And I would once again like to thank you for allowing me to speak today. And I hope that you consider the ideas and suggestions of myself and the others who have testified. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sykes, for your community activism in registering people to vote and also uh, in the advice that you presented today. Um, based on what previous speakers have said, do you have any opinions about keeping the counties whole? I, I mean, I would just add that I, I do think it's important that we do keep the counties whole. I think it 
it minimizes confusion um, for voters. So. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it. Caitlin Nicholson. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, to the committee for hearing me today. I really appreciate it. I am Caitlin Nicholson. I live in Winona, Minnesota. And the first thing I really want to ask the committee today, when we're talking about um, drawing new lines for our district and everything, it is so important that we leave politics out of it. And by that, I mean, we cannot have districts that favor one political party over another or favor a particular candidate. We've seen this happen throughout the country through gerrymandering, and it doesn't allow fair representation to our to the um, citizens of Minnesota on the ground. And so I really ask that we draw the districts without trying to favor um, political parties or candidates. The next thing I wanna bring up is the idea of, we've heard it from everybody today, but communities of interest. We have seen throughout, in the, we have seen historically communities of interest either being split up or concentrated, which really does not help giving a real feel and a real on the ground experience for people in, this, in the state. We need these communities of interest to be taken into consideration and not split up when possible, but they can't also all be concentrated into one district or one area. We need our districts to truly represent what Minnesota is. Finally, I would like to bring up the idea of, as Ethan said, um, keeping our districts convenient. You do wanna be able to drive from one area to, to the other and not have to actually leave the district. But the other half of that is, is when we talk about, we've heard it from people, leaving counties whole. But if you can't do that, we at least need to leave cities whole and towns whole as much as humanly possible. It's not just about creating confusion, but we want to see people engage their, engage their elected officials. We want to see people call up and talk to their elected officials and know who their elected officials are. When people, when neighbors aren't represented by the same person, it actually um, causes them to feel disengaged from the political process and they're less likely to actually reach out to their elected officials because they don't know who they are when one neighbor is represented by one person and they're represented by somebody else. So the more we can keep um, cities and towns in the same area so that neighbors are represented by the same person, the better it is for people being able to engage in the political process. So, so thank you guys so much today for giving me the time to speak to you. I really greatly appreciate it. Well, we appreciate your uh, participation and your advice also. Um, And uh, who is the uh, other testifier that is kind of napping? This is, <laughs> Ivan, this is Ivan Frederick. He's two months old. Oh, he's wonderful. You're Thank very you. lucky. Yes. Yes. I, yes. So much. He, he is insisted on having cuddles during testimony. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Nicholson and son. Greg Bartz. Yes, for the for the record, my name is Greg Bartz, and I live in rural Brown County near Sleepy Eye. I'm not representing any organization. I'm a Lewis veterinarian, and I practiced in a food animal practice in Carver County before coming to the Sleepy Eye area to farm, where I have done so for the past 41 years. Currently, I'm the president of Brown County Farm Bureau. And in the past, I served on the Minnesota Farm Bureau Board, representing 12 counties in South Central Minnesota, which is in the heart of the first congressional district. I also served on the board of Minnesota's Agriculture Interpretive Center, also in the first district. Working with these groups and other community groups, such as my church, I often hear people's hopes and concerns for our rural area. For the past 20 years, the first congressional district has had similar boundaries along southern Minnesota from Wisconsin to South Dakota. It has all of all our parts of 21 counties. I encourage you to keep similar boundary lines in the future. The first district is a strong agriculture district with some of the best egg production in the country. Being a healthcare professional myself, I appreciate that with Mayo Clinic, we also have a premier healthcare industry in the district. With these two industries, air culture and healthcare, many small, small businesses spring up to complement and fill the needs they create. 
So agriculture, healthcare, and small businesses are the main job creators in the district. I hope you can keep these communities of interest together as you draw up the new district. Um, having a district with voters of similar interests allows the elected congressperson to do a better job and they can concentrate their efforts in those areas of similar interests. Politically, the first district is a very competitive district with elections going back and forth between the parties. In the past 20 years, the district has been won by Democrats 12 years uh, to only eight years for Republicans. I hope you don't gerrymander the district, mixing different geographic areas and different areas of interest together. The current district has worked well for rural Minnesotans. I hope you don't make huge changes. Using the past criteria for drawing boundaries seems to be a fair keeping similar interests and geography together. We all want good government, which comes from good representation. Drawing fair districts will help getting good representation. I thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? Um, Mr. Parks, would you mind answering? Um, when you leave your area, where do you go? Uh, Chair Murphy, um, I try to do business locally in the Sukai area. Uh, the next local area would be New Alm, which is also in Brown County. Uh, generally going to the east. Uh, if you have to go further east, go to Main First District, um, and then the metro area. Okay. Many, many people around here use a Mayo Clinic too if they get uh, referrals for medical problems. Do you think many people go from Wisconsin to South Dakota and South Dakota um, when they go across a CD1? Uh, Chair Murphy, are you talking uh, if they're traveling, uh, such as vacations? No, but the uh, then, common then interest would... stuff. The the things you were talking about, common interests, and that other people have talked about common interests in CD1. Um, is a really common interest between um, the the uh, the counties on the southeast to the uh, southwest. Uh, Chair Murphy, I I believe there is, um, especially in agriculture. I mean, the uh, the district is so strong in agriculture. Uh, for instance, I I believe the first district is in the country is number two in pork production. Number one being a district in Iowa. Um, agriculture is is similar going across the first district from east to west. Uh, so I, I do think we have a lot of similar interests. Okay. And another testifier talked about neighborhood food hubs and that's part of the agriculture too, is it not? Uh, Chair Murphy, correct. And then also uh, uh, when you're producing food uh, on the farm, you need processing facilities, transportation, all that. So. Uh, you know, all, all the air culture industries uh, work together to provide, you know, for the people of the country. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Madam Chair, may I ask a question? Yes, Vice Chair Cleburne. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Bartz, for your uh, testimony. I greatly appreciate it. I just want to know, um, when you're... Your focus has been primarily on congressional districts, right? And making sure that you have the representation at the federal level for the agriculture. I'm wondering on the legislative level, if you could help me understand if the needs, and this goes to Chair Murphy's question also, the agricultural needs, are they diverse along the bottom in the CD1? So that for legislative districts, there would be a, a better pairing 
I guess, of those agricultural interests? That would be my question. Are there counties that are better linked together than others for, for the legislative purposes? Mr. Barts. Chair Murphy, Representative. I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. Uh, I do think the surrounding counties around me are, are you know, very similar. Um, we're fortunate in Brown County that the whole county only has one representative and one senator. Uh, that makes it much simpler for people to know who represents them and to be able to contact them. Uh, we heard that uh, from Dodge County. Is, is that, uh, maybe explain your question a little bit better? Yeah, I apologize. So uh, you mentioned that one portion of the uh, uh, congressional district has pork producers, and I'm thinking another portion of the state may have uh, commodity uh, row crops or something like that. So I'm wondering, with their agricultural interest, do you consider them to be the same, or do they have separate agricultural interests on, let's say, east to west? Mr. Bartz. Chair Murphy, Representative. Um, Livestock and crop production uh, go together. You need both. Uh, corn and soybeans are the main uh, crops in the first district. There's many other crops also. Um, for instance, we had canning crops uh, in this area. We used to raise that. There was a canning plant in Sleepy Eye that uh, has closed down. Um, but, uh, you know, there's very you know, it's, it's diverse as far as having different types of livestock, whether it's dairy, uh, uh, beef, uh, pork, uh, but you also need the crop production, um, you know, for that also. So everything kind of works together. And, and it works together also uh, um, when you're producing livestock with crops, uh, the waste products are, are the best source of fertilizer for growing the, the next year's crop. Thank you very much. I appreciate the response. Thank you, Mr. Bartz. We appreciate your testimony and your advice. Thank you. Bruce Kaskabor. Very well said, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I was uh, going to speak to the uh, congressional district uh, redistricting. Um, uh, perhaps I'm mistaken. Perhaps this was supposed to be more about the uh, state legislative district, but perhaps I can touch on both. Uh, as for CD1, as for CD1, uh, demographer Brower showed that uh, we're, we're going to probably need to add about uh, 22,000 uh, population in order to get CD1 up to uh, the average for the state. Um, it seems to me an easy add uh, potential solution here would be to add Wabasha County back to the congressional district. It was uh, in CD1 uh, until 10 years ago. Um, it does have ties to um, the rest of the congressional district, as Mr. Bartz just mentioned. Uh, for instance, we're largely rural, and uh, as is Wabasha. Uh, Wabasha has some ties already to us in the sense that uh, Rochester Public School System includes uh, southwestern Wabasha County. And uh, it would seem to be a natural add, and that all by itself uh, would get us uh, way within the 1% margin or, or difference that's looked for for uh, CD populations. Um, as for the local stuff, I would uh, include sympathy for Ms. Rolf's uh, position in, uh, regarding Dodge County. Um, boy, there, there's winning the lottery, and then there's Dodge County. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's as though we, we, we noticed 10 years ago that, um, uh, it's as though, almost as though the whole state was, uh, districted at the state legislative, uh, level. And then all the leftovers were thrown into Dodge County. Um, it would be great. And it would seem possible to, um, to have a little better care taken for every County and for Dodge not to, uh, or any County to end up the way Dodge did the last 10 years. Uh, as for Olmstead County, I think it's probably going to be natural. We're going to see a compression uh, into uh, the city of Rochester just due to population growth. Um, I don't know if uh, Mr. LeBeau's uh, particular uh, uh, suggestion uh, matters much. I'm sure we'll see more 
uh, more concentration in, in the House districts and probably Senate districts into the city of Rochester. Um, but as I mentioned, I, I only came prepared to speak to the uh, congressional district districting. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your advice and for your um, overall summary of um, past changes that took place. We appreciate that. The next person is Yvonne Simon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and good morning to you and the members of the committee. I am Yvonne Simon, as we said. I live north of Lake Crystal, which is in Blue Earth County, and I'm not representing any specific organization. I'm speaking to you as a concerned citizen from the first district, and as someone who's been involved in agriculture for over 30 years. I've worked with the Minnesota Corn Growers Association, with Minnesota Farm Bureau, and am a reindeer farmer, and yes, committee members, there are such things as reindeer. They do exist. I am coming before the committee to voice my opinion and uh, add to what others have said and may say uh, in their letters that are submitted when you consider and deliberate on the potential reshaping of the district. If you don't, or rather, I don't believe in dividing up the state into wedges. Um, for instance, that maybe have a point up by the Twin Cities and go outward from there uh, to serve the counties of congressional districts, that would not do as well as what we currently are. Um, it sounds like perhaps Greg and I collaborated on our presentations because we have common points. We did not talk to each other. But I also wanted to mention that the district has been working well for a long period of time. And there are three main interests, which Greg also mentioned, which are agriculture, medical, and then the smaller businesses. It's a great district that has a lot of diversity and that has been mentioned by other people that have testified as well. In the agriculture area nationally, we are ranked number eight for corn, number three for hogs, and number two for reindeer production. Uh, this is intense, strong agriculture area. Add to that the strength of the medical systems that we've talked about, Mayo. You can also talk about Gunderson system and Sanford. Then the plethora of unique businesses that we have. They range from breweries to cement truck uh, manufacturers to wind farms, ethanol plants, the largest manufacturer of boat docks, one of the world's uh, largest manufacturers of dump bodies, hoists, and platform for trucks manufacturing. And that's just to list a few. We're much more diverse than that. Southern Minnesota was founded on self-sufficiency, a largely a part of our culture, and a can-do attitude. What works well and has worked well is like-minded people and industry. We should not break that up, as many have said before me. I'm suggesting that the district remains, needs to remain approximately 95% the same in order to keep that working well. It would be easier for a legislator to help represent this area if they have a similar point of view. That also has been several, mentioned several times today. Thank you for your attention, my thoughts, and the time given. We really appreciate the the advice that you have given, and uh, it fits with the other things we've heard today. But we haven't heard anything. What specifically is different about a reindeer farmer and a beef cattle farmer? I had a suspicion that question might come up. <laughs> One thing. Um, 
What is numbers? Uh, there's less than a thousand reindeer in the whole lower 48 states. So when we say number two for reindeer production, it's all relative. Instead of having herds of hundreds to thousands, I'll give you an example. Our herd is currently at 45. And yet we're still second in the nation. And other than that, quite interesting, the um, rations that reindeer eat are very similar to cattle. The testing, the shots, uh, medications, treatment of them is the same. One large difference is we are required to have eight foot fences where cattle are not. Oh, because they can jump higher. Actually, that's interesting. Reindeer don't jump high. They fly, yes, but they don't jump high. <laughs> and uh, they, they're leapers out. So really what the eight-foot fence is for is to keep other species out of the reindeer pen that might potentially bring disease in. Oh. And by the way, they're classified as a cervid. You may have heard that term in yeah. uh, some of the legislating bills yeah. and discussions. Um, so as far as people are concerned, a servant is a servant is a servant, and there is not a differentiation. In the case of reindeer, they've been domesticated since 600 AD. And uh, so they are more of a cow, if you will, or a horse or a sheep type animal because they are so integrated with humans and have been for many, many years. Are they ever pets? Oh, yes. And they're mischievous. Huh. Uh, if they know you and you go in the pen to work on the fence or something, they'll try to untie your shoelace. Um, if you lay down a glove or a tool, they'll pick it up and run away like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> uh, so very curious and um, never a dull moment for sure. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate your advice uh, concerning Congressional District 1 and um, the areas that and the business people that make up that um, Congressional District 1. Thank you for your advice. You're welcome, and thank you for the thank you for the time, Chair Murphy. You're so welcome. And that completes the list of people who have signed up from the first district. Um, and as I mentioned before, we will continue to accept written testimony through the end of September, where it will be posted on the redistricting committee web website. Members, we will break now until 1130. When we come back from recess, we will hear the people from the second congressional district with their advice of what we should do as we adopt principles and start our thinking about where the redistricting lines will go. This meeting is in recess.